as always, it is a real pleasure to welcome you to this um, online panel discussion on science diplomacy, a topic uh, still little known by the public, but which International Geneva has made one of its priorities. I do not want to preempt tonight's uh, debate, but I must confess that the question we are going to discuss tonight, science diplomacy or a slogan or a concrete asset for society, is uh, rather theoretical because from my point of view, the answer is quite obvious. This is at least what the action of the Swiss government suggests. And as you may know, in the last few years, two important um, initiatives have been launched to position Geneva as the future hub for science multi uh, multilateralism. First, the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator, a foundation co-founded by the Swiss and the Geneva authorities. And second, the Geneva Science Policy Interface, uh, which is an academic platform launched by the University of Geneva with the support of the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. <clears throat> More recently, the Swiss government has appointed a rowing ambassador as the first special representative for science diplomacy here in Geneva, uh, Ambassador Alexandre Fazel, uh, who is currently serving in London, uh, is expected to be already here in early June. Within the this ecosystem of international Geneva, several international organizations as the CERN and the IPU, to name uh, two of them, are also actively working for many years to bring science and diplomacy close, to, close together. <clears throat> but what is uh, science diplomacy at all? <clears throat> Can uh, building bridges between science and diplomacy contribute to enhancing multilateral effectiveness in addressing global challenges? And if so, how? To discuss uh, this issue tonight, we are very fortunate to have uh, among us five key players of international Geneva. Martin uh, Chungong, Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union. Michel Jarot, Secretary General Emeritus of the World Meteorological Organization. Daria Robinson, Executive Director of the Diplomacy Forum of the Geneva Science Diplomacy Anticipator, and Nicola Seidler, Executive Director of the Geneva Science Policy Interface. And last but not least, uh, Maurizio Bona. Uh, Maurizio is Senior Advisor of the CERN and is also member of the Executive Committee of the Club Diplomatique de Genève. And, uh, Maurizio will moderate uh, the tonight's uh, discussion. So without further ado, I give you the floor, dear Maurizio. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, it's an honor for me to moderate this event at the Club Diplomatique. And I would like uh, to welcome all the participants and uh, to remind them that uh, the last part of this meeting will be devoted to an interactive dialogue between panelists and the audience. Therefore, participants will have the possibility to submit questions, if they like, via the Q&A link that they can find at the bottom of the Zoom window. I thank the participants who have already sent some questions in the past days to the Club Diplomatics Secretariat, and we'll keep these questions into consideration during the discussion. The topic of the event of today is science diplomacy a term which is becoming more and more popular and a term which is intrinsically fascinating because it refers to two domains that are in their turn intrinsically pretty fascinating too science and the diplomacy however beyond the fascination that the terms represent uh, it's difficult to define in precise way the contours of what science diplomacy is and I would like to invite you to reflect on, uh, to try reflecting on what it means in reality, uh, science diplomacy. And I will give you some uh, ideas on which uh, also the discussion could be developed uh, later. And in particular, I think it would be important also to try to place science diplomacy in the multilateral context 
and hence in the context of international Geneva. To the majority of uh, the people, uh, science diplomacy means something which is quite, uh, quite obvious, intuitive and straightforward. It's, uh, it has to deal with the relations between science on one side and the world of uh, diplomacy and policy making on the other side. The Royal Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, also, science also known as AAAS, published in 2010 an interesting paper called New Frontiers in Science Diplomacy. This paper has become a sort of Bible for the definition of science diplomacy. And in extreme synthesis, I would like to tell you which are the three categories and scenarios that uh, this uh, paper defines. One is science for diplomacy, the other one diplomacy for science, and the third one is science in diplomacy. You can read this paper, it's quite interesting. But the question is, are these categories and scenarios exhaustive or is science, in, science diplomacy a more complex topic? The answer to this question uh, is complex and I would suggest to reflect on what we generally mean with the term science and with the term diplomacy. Science, as you know, encompasses uh, at large all families of science, which include hard science and social science. However, social sciences are already present and sometimes often and sometimes also well placed in policy making processes. Therefore, with science, at least in, the, in this discussion uh, of mine, I will try to uh, refer mainly to hard science, scientific research as we do at CERN, for instance. Uh, diplomacy in reality is not just the diplomatic service of uh, countries, but it's uh, something that includes also policymakers, other policymakers, parliaments, governments, and also private actors, which take important decisions for the, uh, for the society. What can CERN, uh, sorry, what can science offer to diplomacy and policymaking, or more generally to the society? I think it can offer two main things. Knowledge, which is the result of basic, basic research and in some cases, the result of applied research and know-how, which is the result of the technological development generated by knowledge. And these two things are distinct things, knowledge and know-how, even if often sometimes people tend to confuse them and they can contribute in different ways to policy making. In reality, when people and policymakers and also diplomats think in terms of uh, science for, let's say, increasing the relations and improving the relations between science and policymaking, they rather think to the know-how part. So science really intended in terms of technology or technological uh, results of the scientific uh, uh, development of knowledge. But, uh, this is not really the only contribution science can give to policy making and to diplomacy. I would like to uh, point out that uh, uh, there is something which is quite uh, factual. In modern times, uh, science and technologies, uh, technology have been the drivers of the major uh, epochal societal transitions and transformations. This is well known and it's also accepted uh, widely by, uh, by society. But how can it be that despite this, diplomats and policymakers on one side and scientists and technologists on the other side, in many cases, develop their mutual relationships beyond um, a facade of formal respect on suspect and in some cases also on badly dissimulated mistrust. I have no exhaustive answer to this question, and I hope that the panel today will develop some good ones and propose some idea, the panel, to improve the situation. However, I would like to offer to the panelists and to the audience, coming to the, uh, close to the end of my presentation, two possible suggestions for a reflection on this important point of the difficulty between science and policy making to have a, an effective and intense relation. First possible suggestion, the historical cultural distance between the two worlds, which is also induced by 
traditional educational schemes that are rather based on separation of careers. A scientist will very likely do science in, in, in future. Uh, a, um, a person involved in, uh, in uh, international relations studies, in uh, social science, and et cetera, et cetera, will develop in another field. This is something that, uh, in my opinion, has brought us a problem of uh, language and the capability of understand the language used by the other parts and try to uh, find a, a sort of common denominator that uh, permits to advance uh, together. I would like to make an example on this because it's important, the language and the understanding of what uh, the language means. Take um, a concept which is negotiation. Negotiation and reaching the maximum advantage for, from negotiation is really key in diplomacy and in policy making. Believe me, the concept of negotiation is practically unknown to scientists because when they do science, they do not negotiate. They try to reach the uh, common objective in collaboration with other people. This is just an example, but uh, there are many others. This cultural distance often leads to considering the contribution that science can provide just from the point of view of the know-how it can bring in. So a sort of technical input to a need that the policymaker has in order to solve a specific problem. And this is not all because knowledge might help in solving the present problem, but also in anticipating the, uh, the, the problems that might come in the future and in designing future perspectives for the uh, solution of the problem. Second and last possible suggestion I would like to offer to you is that uh, perhaps the problem might reside also in uh, the difficulty to have a vision that goes beyond the dimension of national or regional interests, and rather a vision aiming at a result useful for the whole society and not for a country or a group of countries. For a wider perspective, a perspective that looks beyond these national interests, very likely, in my opinion, cooperative models rather than models based on negotiations are perhaps desirable. But this is not uh, easy to achieve. Also because, and this interest in particular Geneva, international Geneva, the present multilateral system was not built and does not operate based on this perspective. It's a place where negotiation mainly takes place. So as I said before, the whole picture is quite complex and strengthening the cooperation between science Diplomacy and policy making requires efforts and also the courage to change some paradigms. A long process indeed, but which better occasion than this panel of today to start this process? Therefore, without subtracting more time to the panelists, I would like to start with the first question to the panel. And I would like to address it to, to Michel Giraud. Michel, I remember that during the preparation of the the, of the Paris Climate Conference and during the conference itself, uh, I was struck by the unusual relationships between negotiators and scientific organizations. Can you tell more about it and about the differences with previous similar conferences, and in particular Copenhagen 2009? And can these rela relationships be a sort of model for the solution of other problems? Michel, the floor is yours. No, th thank you very much, uh, Maurizio, for this introduction and also for what you described earlier, because it makes my life a lot easier, because I will often refer to, to the points you, you mentioned. And indeed, when it comes to uh, metrology and climate science, there has been a, a somewhat unusual relationship between diplomacy and science, at least in, uh, um, along the concept you just, uh, you, you, you just mentioned. And one of the reasons is that when it comes to metrology and climate, first of all, we don't, we're lucky. We don't have to justify the benefit of cooperation. It goes almost without saying because all countries need to cooperate with each other. No country, not even the largest one, can do it alone. So they need to, uh, to have relationship with the, um, with the others. Um, the, the other point is that all countries, and that is not unique, but it's not so frequent. 
benefit more from this cooperation. That is, they get more back than what they, they put into things. And therefore, as a, as a consequence of that, there was a number over the last 150 years, a number of iteration between diplomacy and science. A number of projects were initiated, uh, a number of campaigns, for example, the International Geophysical Year in 57, 58, after the Second World War, was designed to precisely get scientists from the Eastern Bloc and from the Western Bloc to work together on some of these uh, of these projects. At the peak of the Cold War in 1963, uh, Russia, uh, sorry, Soviet Union at the time and USA decided to initiate a globe, what is called WWW, not the one you think, the original WWW, the World Weather Watch. And the idea was to make sure that all countries would exchange all their information, irrespective of whether they were considered as essential, sensitive or not. And it included satellite data from both, uh, from both sides. So that's, so to, to say, to, to, to set the scene and to show how essential uh, these uh, these aspects have been, and they were always uh, there was always iteration between the scientist and the diplomat. Because you can imagine that if you take a decision on exchanging data across country, it's not just a scientific decision. Of course, it is important for science, but it involves a political a political level. So the the, the two sides had to to it iterate. Now back to some of the points you mentioned, Maurizio. One of the, one, one, there are huge cultural differences, not only amongst countries, but amongst, as you mentioned, scientists and diplomats. One of the things is that science is based on facts. You mentioned that. It's based on the laws, fundamental laws of physics when we come to, to weather and climate. Now, you can negotiate with your enemy. You cannot negotiate with the laws of physics. That is not possible. So that introducing a, a, an element which is uh, quite uh, interesting and which was a, a bit of a cultural shock for some because you cannot play around with, with these facts. Uh, some people have tried, and by the way, you were referring to Copenhagen to uh, dismiss the, uh, the, the observation with respect to greenhouse gases uh, observation. Sorry, we observe them with the most modern thing. You cannot argue with the facts and you cannot negotiate with the laws of, of physics. And the science has always transcended cultural differences. That is, scientists from wherever they come, uh, they, and you know that in CERN, of course, they get on together very well. They work together. That's not a, that is not a, a, an issue. Some governments, and, uh, and uh, I hope that uh, no one in the audience will take it as an attack, but some governments have been trying to hide or distort some scientific facts. But it's almost impossible when it comes to metrology and, uh, and, and climate. You cannot hide it. Um, you can, uh, as an example, for example, sometimes if a weather station, uh, the location is modified by a few, uh, by 10 meter, getting higher by 10 meter, it can be detected in real time from the, from any other country. You can detect any attempt to play with this, uh, with these data. And because this science is based on, on things you can verify, uh, you can, you can check. Climate science is not a matter of belief. It's not a matter of faith. It's not, you cannot say, do you believe or not in climate change? No, that's the wrong question. Actually, is, are you uh, in agreement with the decision which have to be made? Uh, that can be questioned. There are still some remaining scientific questions where we don't have the answer, but it's not just a matter of believing or not believing. It's a matter of scientific objectivity. And therefore, because it's based on this objective thing, it's, uh, it builds trust. Now, as an example of that, if something very interesting was the setting up the creation of the IPCC. You have all heard about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change when it comes to, to climate change. And it was from the start designed as an independent process, but also an authoritative process, uh, making uh, every six years, seven years, reviewing what is the state of knowledge with respect to climate change. And all scientists involved in climate research were involved in this, uh, in this assessment. Now, very interesting in, in, in terms of the relation between science and diplomacy. The report of the IPCC are, uh, have to be seen as policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. So it's back to you, to your point. 
scientists don't want to be diplomats. They, they, they are doing complementary role. But what we, what we, um, the, her ambition is to make sure that we provide the best possible information for diplomats so that they can make the best possible, uh, the best possible decision. But we also tell them, we tell them what we know, but we also tell them what we don't know. So in the IPC report, there's this interesting concept where we try to quantify our knowledge, but also our lack of knowledge on some other issue. It's a level playing field, very unusual in diplomacy. You are not trying to get an advantage by hiding some facts. No, everyone has access to the same information. So that's, a, that's also a, 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 maybe a little uh, unusual. There's no, they cannot be by uh, construction, some hidden information. And you mentioned Copenhagen and Paris. Indeed, I would see them as two opposite milestones. In Copenhagen, because some government didn't like what was uh, being developed, they tried to undermine the credibility of science. And they did that by really, uh, and it was not only, uh, it was a, a number of people, lobbies linked to some private companies who tried to undermine the credibility of that by attacking even the, uh, the, the scientists themselves. So it diverted the effort in Copenhagen from the real negotiation and, and we had to fight against, against this, this information. So this was a, a, a sort of bad example of the link between science and diplomacy because we couldn't have a constructive link. It was more to try to fight all these fires which were, uh, which were happening. And Paris was the opposite. In Paris, these skeptical voice were almost inaudible. In Paris, there was an incredibly high quality dialogue between the scientists and the, and, and the negotiators. Negotiators were often coming to us, to IPCC, to UNESCO, to all the organization there to say, look, what if? Can you tell us if we do that, what would be the consequence? Can you tell us what would be the consequence? And it was a very, very constructive um, uh, dialogue. And uh, we, we, we felt very encouraged by, uh, by that. But you mentioned another point, and it's still a problem, the, the language which is used by scientists is often very different from the language that decision makers or uh, diplomats uh, are, are used to. And I'm not talking English versus French, I'm talking really our jargon versus their, jar, their jargon. And many scientists do not put enough attention, they do not consider that problem as serious enough. So I plead guilty for my community, we have to make more effort in trying to adjust our language in a way which can be used by, uh, by diplomats and decision makers. So let me, I have to probably use more, most of my time, Maurizio, so I'm coming to, to, to some key conclusions, some of them may be a bit provocative. So science certainly doesn't should not replace diplomacy. Scientific information should be there in support of diplomacy, but of a somewhat different diplomacy, because it's not diplomacy where you try to get an advantage by having information that your uh, the other side doesn't have. It's diplomacy which has to be reinvented to, to make use of that, to say everyone has access to the same information. Think about what's happening to the current pandemic, and you will see some similarities, but also some fundamental uh, differences on, on, on that. So there's a, a strategic thinking which is required how to uh, to get the best of this interaction between the, the two worlds. So to some extent, it will need, there will be a need to redefine, I believe, the rules of uh, the rules of the game of, of, of diplomacy. Can it be an example for some other problems? Yes, I believe, uh, I believe, I believe so. There are many, as I mentioned, uh, analogies and lessons to be learned from what happened in both the climate uh, negotiation, science, science diplomacy, and what's happening on the health issue. So let me stop here. I hope I just uh, gave a few elements for thinking. Thank you very much, Michel. It was a very interesting uh, introduction uh, to the, this complex program. Um, now I would like to give the floor to Daria and ask her, based on uh, her experience uh, bridging science and society, with that, what are the biggest challenges in making science and technology accessible to all you have to, 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 to face? And what role can scientific anticipation play in tackling, tackling, tackling global challenges? And I would like also maybe that you uh, comment on what anticipation means, because this is something that maybe is not obvious to everybody. Please, you have the floor. Thank you, Maurizio, and um, and thank you to the to the Club Diplomatique, our, our friends in Geneva, and to all of you to be there because it's such an important topic, and we don't really get a chance, especially not in Geneva, to 
to put such an importance on it. And uh, and and Jezza is the new kid on the block, so thank you for 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 having us. And um, I think it's particularly amusing because I'm a, I'm a kid of the Geneva Internationale uh, growing up here. My grandfather was a was a member of the Secretariat of the League of Nations. My father was Council Affairs at the GATT and the Professor at HID. And because they were there saving the world, I decided I didn't need to do that. And therefore I went into astrophysics to understand how the world was made instead. And indeed it, it was, uh, it was it, the Geneva Internationale and it has an amazing, uh, an amazing presence. Now, it's really by going into this field of science, of hard science, as you said, Maritio, that I realized the huge gap between going home, trying to explain why we need to develop superconductors or complex modeling to understand the formation of galaxies and, and, and facing these discussions or, or when my father would have ambassadors at the house and you know, we really, we could not speak the same language. So it was really, uh, I think an important moment that, that led me really to want to, to work on that gap until uh, starting with the European space, space agencies and ending up 30 years here uh, after in, in Geneva at JESDA um, and realizing even more the role that Geneva can have in, um, in bridging that gap and uh, bringing science at the middle of the, of the multilateralism and bringing, bringing science as a stakeholder at the table. I think that's part of the important discussion is how do you make science not as a topic but as a as a as an as a stakeholder part of the discussions so how do you you know making science and technology accessible to all uh, that's indeed a challenge science is a human right uh, at least uh, it's i think we all we all the benefits of science are a human right and when you mean accessible there's the way of accessible to different continents. So indeed you need to make sure it's robust, it's, it's achievable, it's, it's accepted. Uh, and, and, and therefore you need to think with different mindsets in terms of cultures and continents. Um, but there's the concept of accessibility in terms of understanding. Um, it's difficult to understand what science can bring, what the impacts can science have, the, the positive, the negative impact. And so for me, what's more important is the accessibility in that definition, is the access to the understanding like, uh, like Michelle and, and you Maurizio underlined quite significantly. And, um, and also the, um, you know, if, if you really want to benefit from that science, you, you need to, you almost need to bring the, the, the architect and the homeowner together, you need to bring the science and the diplomacy policy world together to to build that house, uh, and it's not uh, it's not you know you you if you bring a house already made you might have uh, surprises and disappointments on 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 the result. So the the challenge is really uh, is about speaking the same language indeed and, and creating this common understanding, and um, I think <laughs> your your. Uh, the point on anticipation is really key. Uh, obviously, the the A in JESDA, um, the and I think that's quite the uh, the value and, and the vision, if I may say, in the Swiss uh, and the Geneva governments to have really uh, launched this in Geneva is how can we take advantage of this ecosystem to to give it a momentum. So when we talk about anticipation, you you see today's world uh, science is developing extremely fast um, exponentially fast on top of it we have this convergence that we call nano bio info cogno if you've ever heard that it's this convergence of these different sciences that because advanced a because the advancement on ai you will be able to do more in the bio and the more in cogno will help you more in the info anyway so there's there's the difficulty of the topic advancing so fast, but there's also the complexity of these conversions. So it's difficult for anybody, even the scientists themselves, to keep track of these advancements and, um, and their effect um, on, on, on what's going to, how they can be used. So by anticipating, um, by anticipating we can, uh, instead of never catching up the train that's already gone, let's put it like that, we can actually get onto the train at the train station. We can actually decide what's going to be in the wagons. We can probably even decide what kind of fuel the train will be using because together 
between the communities of the science and the diplomacy policy, but also business and, 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 and society uh, in a broader sense, we can co-construct what will science will do. And we can decide you know, together the, not only the technology, but does it align to the actual issues that we're trying to solve? Uh, or also we can see, and that's exactly where we are now with Jezza, we're allowed, we can see, okay, um, there are actually gaps that are not technological gaps, they're governance gaps, but that the scientists themselves uh, cannot actually cannot solve by themselves. But there's a very strong, very strong motivation by the scientific community, just as much than the diplomacy and, 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 and policy community to, um, to work on these solutions, to work together. The, we're quite amazed as working with the, the leading scientists around the world now on, on looking at the science anticipation, what's going to be happening in 10, five, 20, 10 25 years in the fields of uh, quantum and advanced artificial intelligence or human genome, et cetera. They actually see stuff that's developing scary at times and they want to make sure that whatever comes out of the labs will benefit humanity. So we're not the only ones. We you uh, listening to us thinking, oh my gosh, let's hope uh, this is used for the for the better, but the, the whole scientific community is there too. And, and they realize also the difficulty to do this building together. So I think the, the how we do that is indeed the challenge. And, and I know I'm sure we'll get to that uh, in the continuing of our, of our discussion, but uh, building that bridge is clearly essential, um, but building a solid bridge together and that's why we're a big proponents of, of making sure the scientific community uh, is part of the equation from the beginning. Thank you, Maurizio. Thank you, Daria. <clears throat> it was a very interesting uh, um, presentation. And I particularly, uh, I was particularly impressed by this reference to anticipating. Uh, we will come back to these uh, in the uh, continuous, uh, in the re rest of the discussion. But uh, I uh, would personally like to, 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 to stress now that I think it's important uh, also to uh, ensure that, that there is a regular um, consultation between the world of science and the world of policy making, because this is the element that might help in anticipating. Uh, the, uh, the coming of different uh, problems for the future, or let's say the solutions to the problems. So this was just a personal um, uh, reaction. I would like now to move to Nicola, who, as uh, was said before, is the director of another platform that has been set up, uh, the Geneva Science Policy Interface Platform, which was set up in 2018, and which has a more operational, let's say, uh, objective than uh, JESDA, which is more at the level of the global understanding and anticipation of problems. And uh, uh, this uh, platform was set up uh, with the goal to enhance the scientific engagement with global governance, uh, with the global governance actors present here in Geneva, in the Geneva uh, international uh, context. And as a platform that has a transversal and quite operational focus, what can you, uh, Nicola, tell us in terms of what you observed as the key levers to promote successful collaboration between science and diplomacy policy actors? Sure. Th thanks a lot, Maurizio. Uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to exchange today on that uh, this very important topic. Um, so, um, well, to, to situate the, the GSPI in that broader uh, science diplomacy spectrum, um, the, the vision that the GSPI was, was uh, built upon is really to strengthen the role of, of the Geneva ecosystem as a hub where science and policy can basically join forces to craft solutions to, to big challenges. And the way we get there, our mission and focus is to help science policy collaborations uh, happen and to support them. Now, um, you know, be, being constituted by uh, leading uh, research institutions from uh, both the natural and social sciences uh, in our governing board, uh, we, we obviously clearly come from a place of appreciation of, of the role of, of science in, in society. Um, and on the one hand, so we, we have science that um, can produce 
uh, evidence and knowledge that changes the way we might see things. Uh, science produces technologies and innovations that uh, change the way we do things. Uh, and science can also create methodologies and mindsets uh, that may change the way we, we actually approach uh, uh, things. On the other hand, uh, policy actors in multilateral settings can, uh, as we discussed before, implement norms and incentives at a large scale that uh, change and influence people's behaviors at the scale of countries, regions, or even globally, uh, as we discussed around uh, climate change. But I think that, you know, beyond um, considering science and policy in different boxes, it's really the combination of both science and policy that can have uh, the most powerful uh, and profound uh, impact. And as such, uh, one point that I think is very important, and that's very important for the GSPA as well, is that it's not enough to just sort of transfer, you know, ready-made knowledge or technologies uh, from science to policy. Uh, there are many cases that we've seen um, uh, in, in the past two or three years where uh, research is produced, uh, presented to policy actors, and uh, very useful inputs are provided, but unfortunately too late in the, in, in, in the, in the process. Uh, whereas similar inputs could have ideally happened much earlier in the research process and could have actually influenced the research to be even more impactful, even more relevant to uh, policy and field needs. And that could have, for example, opened opportunities uh, for the researchers to maybe access more data or be part of policy processes and discussions. So, you know, these are the types of Sort of missed opportunities that we want to avoid and so we gently push um, again you know sort of scientists to go beyond one-way knowledge transfer we gently push policy actors also to invite scientists uh, at the table again earlier on in, in the process now there are different ways to create alignment between science and policy and for example uh, Daria described uh, just as work to highlight, uh, to align sort of high level scientific and diplomatic agendas over the, the long term. Uh, where we come in as the GSPI is to really work at a granular level to support collaborations that um, involve professionals from uh, the scientific and the policy side, uh, more specifically in the context of international Geneva. Um, and so we do that by connecting people who are not yet connected. Uh, we help collaborations happen and support them with, with a targeted advice, for example, through calls for projects. Um, we try to contribute also to professionalize that field of science policy collaboration in Geneva with best practices, creating communities of people committed to that, uh, building capacity as well with trainings. And that gets to your, your point as well, Marie, too, about education, which uh, maybe we'll get back to in the discussion, which, which is very important. Um, and, you know, I think that if we take a step back um, on the projects that we've supported over the past two, three years on issues around climate change, humanitarian action, uh, health, uh, chemical waste, etc., we really see the, the need and, and the value to support capacity and skills of people in science and in policy that carry those projects uh, that can take the shape, for example, to help scientists think about the political context um, around their issue or, you know, mapping who are the political play players in their domain. Uh, and that gets uh, also to Michel Jarreau's point. Um, it's also about helping decision makers on how to deal with information overload or how to deal with complexity. It can sometimes be um, uh, overwhelming for decision makers to receive a lot of scientific information or other types of information and being able to sort of triage uh, that information. So um, for us, you know, that's a point I wanted to make in this introduction is that, um, you know, it's, it's very important to focus on that because it's been said before, it's not easy or straightforward for scientists and policy actors to work together. As we said before, these are different professional cultures. There are different timings of research and policy. Um, and you know, I won't get into the details of that. We covered that already, but it's very important to 
support again and recognize those people in the science and policy spheres who are in a position to be boundary spanners, translators, ambassadors for the science policy collaboration mindset, people basically who are able to cross over their own professional and educational boundaries to engage uh, with others. And you know, as part of that broader ecosystem of science diplomacy uh, that focus on the people that carry collaborations and providing them with the skills and support uh, is one key aspect of the discussion. So um, with that, I'll stop there and uh, very happy to engage further in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola. Uh, <clears throat> as I said in my introduction, science can bring something which goes beyond the pure technicality of the technological solution it develops. And this uh, uh, is particularly important uh, for a field that uh, until a few years ago was considered in particular among scientists as to some extent orthogonal to our, to our work, which is the field of parliaments. And parliaments are very important because they, at the end, they represent the citizens. And I would like to ask Martin, as the Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union, uh, in which way do you think uh, your action, your action in favor of science diplomacy can uh, help uh, using science and the, the different the dimensions of science in the best way, considering their potential and the potential of technology for the good of the, of the humanity. And how do you judge the effectiveness of the relations between these two words? And uh, which are the fields in which today these relations could be improved on your opinion, seen from the perspective of the Interparliamentary Union? Uh. Thank you very much, Mauricio, for uh, that introduction. And um, I, I really am very happy to be part of this conversation. And you have said it, I'm not a technician. I, if anything, I represent the other side, um, the, uh, the policy world. And I, I come uh, to it from the point of view that uh, the policy making community, especially parliaments, have one key constituency, the people. And it is important that whatever we are, are trying to do, we have to make sure that humanity is at the center of our endeavors. And uh, if you will allow me, I, I can say that I, the points that have been made here about the gap between policy and science has been glaring and have been growing over the years. In the IPU, I saw it myself. At a time, uh, some 15 years ago, when the governing bodies disbanded the Committee on Science and Technology. This was, I think we need to address the reasons why this happened. There is insufficient understanding, and that answers your question about the effectiveness of relations between policy and uh, and, uh, and, and science. There's insufficient understanding on the side of policymakers of the benefits, the potential benefits of science. Science is too often viewed as to be very abstract. And the image that science conjures in the minds of uh, policymakers, uh, parliaments, and parliamentarians is that of these people who are far removed from society, spend all their lives in the lab and to do things that are abstracts and the benefits of which are not seen. And when the outcomes are out there, sometimes they have uh, destructive effects, nuclear uh, uh, science, for instance. So uh, I have seen that there has been a change in this uh, perception. And it is, there is growing evidence now, awareness of the importance of science for the well-being of mankind. And parliamentarians have now understood that it is important to put, to give a human face to science. And this is borne out by a number of uh, realizations. First of all, the peace dividend of science, the potential of science to bring people together, to uh, 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 make people who otherwise would be at each other's throats working together. And the third model that I admire very much is something that we're selling where people work you'll find people of diverse origins working on common projects. 
This is something that we use as a model to explain why science is important as a means of bridging the gap between uh, people who otherwise would be in a hostile environment. Then there, is, there are some ethical questions that are arising out of scientific and technological innovation. They are mainly ethical. The rise in artificial intelligence, for instance, the fourth industrial revolution are giving rise to ethical questions and policymakers mm -hmm. are realizing that you need to put in place regulatory frameworks to harness the potential of all of this and to protect the human being from the negative outcomes of or possible negative outcomes of uh, 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 scientific innovation. So uh, we have seen this shift in perception uh, as far as uh, parliamentarians are concerned and they have understood the benefits of science and we are trying to promote, provide a platform for bringing together these communities so that they can be what many people uh, uh, refer to as win-win cooperation. There is, of course, uh, something in there for policymakers. Of course, they can use the outcome of science to benefit their constituents. Science can benefit from parliament's uh, powers to make laws, policies, to uh, provide budgetary resources, and to hold governments accountable for proper management of scientific innovation. And so there is that perception that the two communities can work uh, together and should be working together. So we see that there is that tendency within the IPU today, the Interparliamentary Union, to bring the elephant in the room into the room instead of leaving that elephant outside and talking about the elephant in hushed tones. There is that need expressed for scientists to be at the table when policy is being made, to inform uh, policy, because in this day and age with the, uh, what I'll call the complexity of the issues that, and challenges that have to be addressed, you need scientific evidence. You need science, I think, I think as uh, Michelle was saying, that science is objective, it's based on facts, you cannot really challenge it if it's well conducted. And so it is a good ally for policymakers. They can use this to buttress decisions that they take, policies that they make, in order for those policies to be beneficial to uh, the people. So uh, if you asked me, I would say that it is high time that the, the laboratory scientists came out of the laboratories and went into the halls of policy making and vice versa, policymakers have to leave their ivory towers and go into the laboratory so that there is a common understanding of the respective benefits that come from policy and science for the benefit, benefit of uh, the uh, people. So I think that we are on track and that is what the IPU is doing today. I am very committed. I am glad to see Daria again with whom we're working on in Jester. Uh, but also we are creating our own platforms. I think uh, Mauricio, you have been a prime mover of uh, our initiative. First of all, to create that awareness among the parliamentary community of the benefits of science, the actors and the challenges that are there. And also to use them then to provide more support to the scientific community. And we are doing this on the basis of evidence that is out there. When we look at uh, the Middle East today, you know, when you talk of water, for instance, it's an issue of strife in the Middle East, but you can use science to transform this into an element of peaceful coexistence. If you use science to increase the volume of water in the Middle East, then that element of strife has disappeared. And that is what we're seeing in the Middle East today. And the discussion is taking place within the peace uh, platforms that the IPU is creating. And so uh, my vision is that we put in place an ongoing mechanism within the Interparliamentary Union that will reflect on the challenges and also identify solutions together with the parliamentary community. And you, as you know, uh, uh, Mauricio, we have established the Working Group on Science and Technology. And I pin a lot of hopes on this working group to identify key issues that the IPU should be taking forward and promoting with its members. So uh, I think I should stop at this point and 
if there is time, I can go into more uh, details of what I think it is that the parliamentary can, community can do. But it is clear that the type of diplomacy we, we are doing is not the classical diplomacy of negotiating. It is the diplomacy of harnessing what is out there, the potential that is out there for the benefit of the people that parliamentarians represent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. I obviously agree 100% uh, uh, with what you said. And, but there is an element that I would like to underline, which is your, uh, your reference to uh, the fact of having scientists uh, sitting at the same table when decisions are taken. And this is important because coming back also to what Daria said before, the pace, the, 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 the rhythm of evolution of uh, technology is such today that if you don't have a continuous relation between policymakers and scientists on a trustful basis, it's much more difficult to be capable to, let's say, control the evolution, which means also uh, putting some boundaries for ethical usage of uh, developments in terms of knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. So I fully agree with you, and I thank you for having pointed out these points. Now, the problem is that uh, the discussion is so interesting that we are really a little bit uh, late uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, um, with the program, and I would like to leave at least a quarter of an hour for the interaction with the, the, um, with the audience. So uh, I would like to use these 10 minutes uh, uh, in a more informal way rather than structuring uh, the interventions. And I would like to ask uh, the panelists, uh, to whomever would like to intervene, maybe just to make an example of a concrete action that uh, you or your institutions have uh, taken or are in the pipelines uh, for you and your institutions on science diplomacy. And if you have, maybe just one comment on what the multilateral system and what international Geneva proposes and the effectiveness of these uh, structure and possibly of some ideas that you might have of something that should change in order to make it more uh, effective and more concrete. So who would like to, uh, to intervene? I can jump in, Maurizio. Please. Um, I think there are too many questions <laughs> in your question and too many points to address. And um, but, but perhaps more specifically on what we're doing, and, and as Martin mentioned, uh, we've been spending some, uh, some a lot of brain power on, on together and uh, with his colleagues also, because I think IPU uh, has done an immense work around this question, and we can benefit from, as his colleague says, from, the, from what did not work <laughs> and, not, and to be able to build better what will work. And, uh, and, and part, of the, part of the issue is, uh, is indeed the, uh, we can learn a lot from the organizations in Geneva. And what we've done with Michael Muller, who's the chair of the Diplomacy Forum, have been really scouting and, and, and meeting, uh, virtually meeting, obviously, in the last, <laughs> in the last year, uh, but re remarkably engaged uh, the heads of the, of the organizations, international organizations in Geneva, but also around in New York and, and Vienna and Rome, to, to understand what are the challenges. Of course, we, we reach out to understand, does anticipation has any value for you? I mean, do you understand why we want to anticipate? And it's very clear that um, in all of your agenda, as I would say on the, on the non-scientific laboratory side, uh, we, we realize most people work on today's issues and there's enough to work on with today's problems that really the focus is on, is on today. And when there's a long-term strategy, it's usually five years. And, and, and it's even the problem is that even in five years, probably things will have changed so much that it's, you're always catching up. So there is, there is a need for, for a, for some of us or for a group bringing us together to look beyond that and to be able to anticipate again on, on, your, on your point, uh, Maurizio. So what, what we really do with these leaders and, and we have, we're lucky to have uh, amazing leaders already in Geneva and that's, that's for us also why Geneva is so important to, as a platform for this discussion on science and diplomacy. Um, we say, okay, well, let's look at what's happening in the labs, really in the science. And again, we have amazing scientific institutions uh, in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, Joël Mezo and Martin Vitelli are, are the co-chairs of, uh, 
of the academic side and they're the leaders of the Zurich and, and Lausanne engineering school. So we have the possibility to bring all these leading scientists. And what we did with Martin uh, back in December and uh, with a, a pool of a diplomacy representative and a pool of, of um, lab <laughs> as, we, as we put them is to look together what these cutting edge science topics uh, are again on uh, human augmentation and genome or, or what the future of quantum, but also on some social science issues and say, well, what can we do? What kind of solution do we need to look at that around these fields? And, you know, we can talk more specifically about what came out, but the, the most difficult part of the exercise is exactly to where do you start? Uh, where do you create this common understanding so you can start thinking about building together. And um, to, to, to skip to the end, if we were able to uh, have such a meeting, <laughs> and Martin, you can confirm, where you already understood each other when you walked in, we would be so much more efficient. We could, we could build so many more things and be so much more impactful. So uh, how do you actually create a community of scientists who understand policy and diplomacy and a community of scientists and, and policy and diplomats who understand science, you don't have to understand quantum, but you have to understand what the thinking, the scientific thinking is, the fact that the earth is flat until it's round and that's okay, that's the way it is. And then somebody else will come up with another proof and it'll be that way. So um, the bringing that, the, these communities together, if we could only teach and have a curriculum that actually taught from the beginning between institutions on the diplomacy side and on the scientific side, that would be already a huge step. And again, I think Geneva uh, and Zurich and other places, uh, Ashui, uh, absolutely need to be part of this development. And, and that's something that JESDA is gonna be looking at very closely in the coming year. Thank you very much, Daria. I know that uh, Michelle uh, would like to uh, intervene. So please, Michelle, tell us. And then Martin. Michel? Yeah, uh, I guess you can hear me now. Uh, no, thank you for uh, triggering some question about the multilateral system. And I would like to mention very briefly just one, one issue which is likely to become very critical in the next few years. And that may be of interest to Daria because it's about anticipation. It's, it's, you know, the, as I mentioned, the climate change issue cannot be solved in isolation by one country. And the multilateral approach is absolutely essential because decisions may, made by one country uh, or even a small group of country can have very damaging effect for other countries. So you cannot solve it in isolation. You have to get the whole community talking to, to, together to look uh, at the problem in a holistic manner. Now, that leads me to the problem I wanted to mention, which is, which is emerging now. As you know, we are not on track to fight climate change and we are not on track by a significant uh, margin. So what, what it means is that the impact of uh, the consequence of the part of climate change we cannot mitigate uh, we shall have to adapt and the cost will increase. And there may be some action which are quite dramatic. I'm thinking in particular of what people call geoengineering to say if there are some aspects we cannot address, uh, we cannot uh, avoid, we might have to take dramatic action in terms of modifying the, the planet or something to the, 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 the boundary conditions so that it would have, uh, it would minimize, say, the warming. But the problem is that at this stage, this is not based on any solid science. So you see, it's one area where there will be a, a, a very critical requirement of interaction between the scientific community and the, uh, the, the government, the decision makers, uh, be they uh, in, in uh, uh, state or be they uh, in private sector. We need to have this, this dialogue between science and decision makers and diplomacy will have to play a big role. Because what I can anticipate is that if consequences become dramatic for one country, let's say for one country, the key issue is the impact of climate change on rainfall 
there are ways to modify artificially. The problem is that the science is not ready to tell you what would be the consequence of that on some other, some other issue. So it's like playing with fire. Uh, it's like uh, playing what we call in French les apprentis sorciers. So we, 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 we don't have the science yet, but we need to have this, this uh, dialogue. And if things are being done, there will need to be a governance for that. You cannot have one country or two countries decided this is best for me. How do you have the governance? The governance will have to be multilateral. So I anticipate that yeah. <laughs> a, a, requirement, a, a requirement for a huge dialogue between these two communities uh, over the next uh, years and actually decades. Thank you, Maurizio. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Michel. Uh, and I would like to propose Martin and Nicola, who raised at the end, if they um, accept to, to wait a little bit for the intervention, because we have two questions and I would like uh, not to, to give the impression that we don't want to take questions. So the first question is the question asked by the Deputy Permanent Representative of Oman to the WTO. And he says, or he or she says, in some harmful sectors like cigarettes, we saw how science was manipulated to serve the interests of the big businesses. Recently, the voice of the scientists have been heard, but policymakers are unable to stop cigarettes. He would like to hear uh, the view of some uh, of the members of the, of the panel. Who would like to answer the, this question in a, a short way if possible? Thank you. Okay. Nicola? Well, yeah, I'll jump in very briefly and, and others okay. may have other views, but for me that, that stresses as well the, the, the importance, it's not only the relationship between science and policy, it's also the relationship between citizens and science, right? And I think it's very important and we've seen it also during COVID, the, you know, the, 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 tr the, the, the trust that people have in the government, the trust that people have in science, it, it's really for me a a triangle that we need to work on and I think that maybe in the past we haven't focused so much on again that relationship as well but back to that topic I think you know in, in some ways it's about people's behavior and also convincing sort of conveying the science um, and, 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 and the knowledge to people directly from from scientists as well but just that's just a quick reaction. Uh, Martin would you like to jump in? Thank you. Th thank you, Mauricio. Very quickly, I think that it is important. One of the reasons why there has been the gap between science and policy is that policy, uh, science and its outcome, its product, uh, often are profit-driven. And we, we, have seen, we have seen the issue of access to the vaccines, which is very topical today. I don't know if uh, those who are producing the vaccines have the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the interests of the people at heart. No, if that's another debate. But I think that the solution is that there should be that dialogue between, and that brings me to the point of giving a human face to policy and science. If you bring to the table science and policy, and you bring the people to the table, you bring, for instance, you bring victims of tobacco use to the table. I think that at the end of the day, you have the potential to influence policymakers to take action against tobacco use. So that dialogue should take place. It should not take place without the people being at the table too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Very interesting uh, um, intervention. Now I would like to address the second question, which is uh, a question asked by the chair of the British uh, Swiss Chamber of Commerce. It's a quite a long question, and I would try to resume it in a, in, a, in a very short way by saying that he would like to know if and which role there could be for business in science diplomacy, for the world of business, because he has the feeling that uh, our discussion has touched the world of science, the world of uh, diplomacy and politics, but uh, what about business? And what about uh, the contribution business can be to this? So who would like to reply? I see Daria, has raised the end. Daria, go, please go ahead. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a, a, a crucial question because what, um, of course, there's the citizens to, to include because we want to know, we want to know how they feel. We, we are all citizens. We want to, whatever comes out to be adopted. 
we want uh, the implementation to happen. But unless we have the actors, what we call the impact actors and, and business and philanthropy there to make sure that whatever ideas come out, they're actually implemented and they're anchored into uh, a long lasting, uh, I'd say, uh, world, worlds, because again, one solution might work very well in Africa and not at all in Europe. So you need to also find the right actors for the right places. So we've really, we've really looked at the actors in science diplomacy. We've divided the communities. We have four communities. We have science and diplomacy, academic, but we also have what we called citizens and impact. And they impact, as I said, it really takes uh, the, the broader, it can be startup and innovation, but also business and, and philanthropy. And we believe that it, we have to look at things from, we created this methodology, which we were calling the anticipation situation room. And because you need to actually come up with an idea, very good, what should we do? The think tank part, but unless you have the action and the, and the do tank part, you cannot have a sustainable solution. And to have a sustainable solution, you need to have a business model. You need to have the right actors at the table to help you co-create this part. So we need to co-create the solution in a way together, science, diplomacy, and a blend of other actors. But when it gets time to decide how are we gonna make this thing work? How are we gonna build this new institution? How are we gonna build this new technology? Or how are we gonna create a new framework for neuro rights or whatever the idea will come and, and geoengineering is right up there on that list. Then you need to have a different kind of actors to come and make that happen. And, and business is an essential part of that. And so that's, that's definitely something we have on the radar. And, but again, you need to bring these different actors at different levels. You need, it's like a recipe. You, you can't put too much oil in the mayonnaise right away. Otherwise it won't be a mayonnaise. It'll be a salad dressing. You need to make sure you want a mayonnaise. So you need to be very attentive on the mix and when you deal with the mix. Okay, thank you very much, Daria. Uh, the, I would like to now to ask a question which was uh, asked in advance by um, a person who's a former member of the Greek delegation to the CERN Council. And it's a little bit a provocative question because he says, uh, so far there is no indication of a sort of quantitative method, method to evaluate if uh, it's important or not to, um, to, um, to foster science diplomacy. So there is no econometrical, uh, econometric parameter to, uh, to, to evaluate this. Do you think there should be, um, let's say, a quantitative evaluation of uh, the impact of uh, science diplomacy? Or should uh, you uh, rather suggest that this is something which is not really the main uh, point because it's something that goes beyond the purely quantitative aspect? Who would like to answer this question? Michel, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Maurizio. I think this is a, an interesting and highly challenging question. Um, normally for many things, I'm in favor of having some cost benefit analysis or analyzing that for most, for, for many issues and, and uh, many are being done, including in the field of climate change. Now, when it comes to, uh, to diplomacy to, to the link between science and diplomacy uh, I and that's my initial reaction you know we, we didn't have time to really to think about it but my initial reaction is that I'm a bit uh, uh, I would like to be a little bit cautious because it may be very difficult to quantify these uh, these things although we know from a qualitative point of view uh, and, and many of our intervention we're trying and many of the questions uh, describe the benefit of, of, of that now to quantify that it may be too early too early stage it may be counterproductive because what about if the conclusion at this stage is that oh yeah it's not possible to do that some people may use it to say oh we don't have to worry about it no yes we do have to worry we may not be able to quantify uh, the benefit but we know that we have to worry about it so I, I, I would be rather cautious about it Okay, thank you, Michel. Uh, uh, I will try to squeeze another couple of questions, at least uh, from uh, uh, the questions that were asked in advance. And uh, uh, let's say, uh, selecting rather um, a little bit provocative questions. One of these is, uh, will science diplomacy be again something for rich countries only? Who would like to answer this question?
Martin, please go ahead and unmute your uh, fine. Good. Yeah, no, I, I think I think that uh, it's a very good question. It's a word of caution to all of us as we move forward uh, in our reflection that we have to be careful that science diplomacy does not benefit just the, the rich guys. And uh, as I, I mentioned the issue of access to vaccines, I think that uh, currently, currently access is uh, highly in favor of the, of the, the haves and the have nots are, are still struggling. So it's a, a, an issue that we have to put on the table and discuss to ensure that there's equity, there's equity when it comes to the outcome of the interaction between uh, science and policy. And uh, of course, the, uh, uh, well, I, I'm talking from the point of view of the parliamentary community, which is supposed to make sure that there is inclusiveness and as everybody is saying, that no one is left behind. So it's important that parliaments be aware that whatever policies they are putting in place are beneficial to all of society. I think somebody mentioned it in our uh, discussion tonight. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, another question, which is a, a bit less uh, provocative is, uh, what kind of training do you think uh, would be desirable to provide in order to create sort of experts in science diplomacy? But I would say also in order to give those who are already the actors, the capability to understand the, uh, the language of the others. So what can education, the educational work, world do for this? Who would like to answer this question? Nicola, please. Thanks a lot. Uh, I mean, I'll be brief, it, it can be a long discussion, but I think you can work, um, I mean, first of all, you know, in, in terms of academia, I think there's a lot of opportunity to work with researchers to, as I said before, um, creating sort of, sort of political literacy um, especially with, as you mentioned before, Maurizio, I think that usually you see researchers in political science and international relations having that sensitivity, but for scientists working more on hard or natural sciences, it's not always a given that there is this capacity to, um, or training to take into account, uh, again, political environments, etc. So I think there's work that can happen there and more broadly, incentives within academia. Um, you know, there is a system that promotes, you know, people with doing publications and peer reviews. And, you know, that, that's something that can, can go against people who are building a profile of being, uh, you know, um, interdisciplinary, doing research impact, etc. So I think there is work that can, ha that can happen there. There is work that we can do again with decision makers. And we're going to do around, uh, for example, the high-level political forum for the SDGs. Um, we're going to plan some trainings with UNITA and IPU as well to provide some tools for decision makers grounded in behavioral science and others to, again, increase sort of science literacy in some ways. And finally, it's really, as we said before, it's really through concrete interactions between the two concrete projects between science and policy actors that you also build that long-term relationship, trust, respect, and awareness that you know there is another side that's working on that. Um, and you know, by working together, you develop also those sort of social skills and languages of, of uh, being able to interact together. Okay, thank you very much. We still have one minute, uh, one a couple of minutes. So uh, I see two uh, hands Ray, uh, raising, uh, Michelle and uh, um, Martin. So would you like to give a sort of flash last comment before we close? Michel? Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, it will be very short. Yes, indeed, many scientists uh, are not, have no chance to be exposed to the diplomatic uh, aspects and vice, and, and vice versa. And, and this is a real challenge. But here we have a unique situation in Geneva. And actually the representation on this panel from Nicola, from Daria, from Martin is, is, is a good example of that. We have a unique opportunity where we can get the two communities to learn from, from each other. Actually, you yourself, Maurizio, as you know, you have been teaching on this issue in some institution in Geneva. I'm teaching also on this issue. So we, we, are, we are all participating in that because Geneva is a unique place where you can get, uh, you can learn from each other. Diplo 
diplomats uh, are exposed to some scientific organization, CERN, WMO, uh, and, and a few others. So it's, uh, I think we have to make the maximum of that. The other thing I would mention, and that would be my last point, is that I've seen in a few delegations uh, in the WMO Congress, uh, delegation, it's essentially scientific delegation, but several of them are including diplomats and vice versa. I've seen some delegation in New York uh, asking some scientists when the discussion is on scientists. This is really a great way to, uh, it's part of the education process. So let me stop here. <laughs> Very good. The last word now is to Martin. Martin, please tell us what do you uh, th thank, thank you very much, Mauricio. I, I agree entirely with what uh, Nicholas has been saying a moment ago. Uh, it seems to me that uh, maybe we're not, we, we shouldn't be referring to training, uh, but rather opportunities for uh, mutual learning, mutual understanding. And that is the approach the IPU is using, making available platforms for dialogue between policy and uh, 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 science, you know, and that's, I mentioned the working group on science and technology. I want to see this forum as an ongoing platform for dialogue between policy and uh, science. We want to see more interaction between uh, diplomats, so uh, quote unquote, in the Middle East committee and the scientific community, how they can turn, use science to turn elements of conflict into elements of peaceful coexistence. So for me, the answer is that we should promote more opportunities for interaction between the two communities as a le mutual learning exercise. As somebody said at the beginning of our uh, discussion, uh, we are not expecting parliamentarians or policymakers to be scientific experts and vice versa. What we are expecting to do uh, is for them to understand their respective challenges and solutions that are out there and put this together for the benefit of humanity. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Martin. And with uh, your words, I would like to close the meeting here. It was, uh, at least for me, an interesting discussion with you and also with the audience, despite the limitations imposed by the virtual uh, meeting mode. Uh, I thank you very much, all the panelists. I thank you very much, all the uh, participants in the audience. And I hope that this will be just uh, not the meeting on science diplomacy, but one of the first meetings that we will hold in the context of the Club Diplomatique to discuss about the science uh, diplomacy. Thank you very much, and I wish all of you a good evening. Bye. Thank you.